so long. And I passed, I passed the dog by the creek where I used to play on the way into town. And then the flashbacks come right, rolling back to me again. It takes me right back to Christmas when I was little. I was playing by the creek on the ice with Dookie. Now Dookie for seven years before cancer took her. For seven years Dookie was the love of my life. She was a black Labrador and she was so beautiful. She was the most beautiful dog you ever saw. She was so intelligent. And there we were playing in the ice, and then the ice started to split, and it started to crack. And, and I managed to make it back to the bank, but Dookie, she didn't make it, and it started to split and crack all around her, and there she was. And I waded out into the ice, and I tried to reach her, and she was snarling and, and biting, and, and you know what they get like when they're really afraid. She was like a tiger. She would turn to a wolf again, you know? And I reached out, and I just didn't have the courage. And so I ran back the mile from town to the house, and I burst into the living room. And there he was in the first. I thought he was going to swear at me for getting in front of the TV. You fucking get out of here. But before he could even open his mouth on me, I said, Dookie, Dookie, the ice, Dookie, Dookie, the ice by the creek. And he got up. And I've never seen a drunk man run so fast. And he went out to the creek, and he waded in, and there was Dookie. She was so fierce, and he was getting the jitters. I could tell you could see her teeth flashing. And he reached out anyway. And she got him, and you should have heard him holler. You should have heard him howl, and his fingers were all plugged. Like the roof of the dog's bite. Oh my God. He's dripping into the eyes. And he mastered himself, and he reached out again, and this time he managed to get him. And then he brought her to the back. And he knelt on the ground next to her, and there she was whimpering. Lick his hand and say something. And he reached out with his good hand and patted her on the head and said, You're okay. And then he looked at me and he smiled. And oh God, why do these memories keep coming back? Why can't they let, just let me take them in peace? He was. I won't even tell you what happened when Sherry tried to bring her for his boyfriend home. Oh my God. I'm not wondering what I'm doing here. But the church is full of people, and the pastor is standing there, and he's starting to make me jittery. And I wonder, how the hell did I get here? Why am I even here? Why did I ever come back? And now I remember what I I was 18 years old. I'd left school, and of course, anyone would. They'd want a job, they'd earn some money, and to get out of that town, and that's exactly what I wanted. Well, I said I was going to get a job in the mines. And my dad, he said, no, you are not. He pretty much forbade me from doing so. And my mom didn't want me to get a job down the mines, and neither did she. But the mines were the only job there were, and still are, in this dead-end, dead-eyed, one-eyed, one-horse town. So, I got a job without telling anybody, right on the edge of town in a small bar, and I hoped they wouldn't get a hear about it. But I hadn't been there two weeks before my pa got a hear about it. And I came back on a ship, and I saw this figure standing, standing silhouetted against the sky on the hill. Oh, oh my God, he was scary. I'd never seen him so drunk. He wasn't in his work clothes. He was in a filthy t-shirt and a filthy pair of jeans with a biggest bottle of Jack I'd ever seen. Roar and drunk, and he said to me, Daddy, no son of mine ain't ever gonna work in these mines. You hear me? Over my dead body. And I was afraid, but I wasn't gonna shut up. And I walked up that hill, and I got level with him. And he said, Do you hear me? You give up that job now. Don't you ever work in those mines. Ain't nothing you could do to stop me. And then he grabbed me by the collar. And he got me right nose to nose so I could, I could smell the alcohol on his breath. And he got me right there, right to the nose to nose with him up. And he said, that's what I said.
I'm not staying here. I'm leaving. And they just nodded. And then they said, when are you going? And I said, tomorrow, real early. And they said, I think we're going to be Well, I rose right early the next morning. I packed a few things that I had. I left a note for Mom and Sherry. And just as I was going through the kitchen, I, I sort of stepped. It was $500. No, I didn't want to take it. But I had nothing for the next month. So. I went to North Carolina where I got a job selling produce. Sales. And after a couple of years, I went back. And then after another couple of years, and then there was that time that I, I tried driving hundreds of miles across country, but I got stopped in a snowstorm. The weather turned me back. Too bad. And then I got to where I am now, 32 years of age, and I had to back. And then this phone call comes out of the blue. Sherry must be a say a few words. A few words. You know what? When I heard that, I said to her, me coming back to say a few words, but they all know what he was and know what I think. But that's going to be bigger news in that town than his dying. But here I am. And there's people inside that church. And I take a deep breath, and my mind clears. And I take my cigarette out of my mouth, and I throw it on the floor, and I put it out with my foot. And I walk into that church, and I walk up the aisle, and right at the top of the church, I know what I'm going to do. Because this isn't about what's true. It isn't about what's real or honest. between us all, that we're not quite sure what's happened, that lay upon our mind and haunt us. Let me give you an example. I knew her years ago, and not under circumstances either of us conscious. She treated me as a kind younger man. But when at last, as we both knew we would, we parted, she gave me a journal. I can do no better than to read it to you. And of the account in it, of how, on that her first job, she determined that she would be, I will be, I will be the best governess that ever there was. I cannot describe the excitement I felt when the agency told me and the adventure of the train ride and the carriage ride. There would be one charge, a daughter, Flora. And when I arrived at the house called Bly, and I was shown in by a very austere housemaid called Mrs. Crow, I met Flora. And she was so sweet and charming as pretty as a picture, as wise as a fairy. I felt, I love her already, and I think I did as much. And we sat and chatted about this and about that, as happy as maybe, until it was a real bit. And I sent her off the bed, and off she trotted, the little maid. And I turned and I talked to Mrs. Crow, and I asked her, about 
their own previous tutor, that Florence had already mentioned. Ah, Miss Francis, I did not approve of her, nor did I approve of her partner, Mr. Quince. He was the gamekeeper, but also chiller of mines. And he told those children things that is not right. Not right! But she would say no more, no more at all. Only gave me a letter. Now, it might have made me glad that letter, in other doubts. You see, it told me that we're going to have another visitor. Miles is on his way. For he has been expelled. And mentioned such a reason. I, I, I can't say. But the next day, I drove off in the carriage once again. And I came to the station, and I knew him. I knew him from his photos that Mrs. Crow had shown me. There in his sailor suit, every inch the gentleman, Miles, he greeted me with a knowing look and said, Enchanted, I'm sure. Before we go anywhere, I suppose you know what has happened. But do you know why? I can't imagine. It could be nothing I had done. And he would say no more. So we drove back. But as we came to the courtyard in Rye, I looked at the ornate ruined tower. And it seemed to me, if but for a moment, in the bad light, I saw two figures trying to catch my eye. But I said nothing to the children. And the brother and the sister were as happy as you can be to meet, to meet each other. And we all three chatted. And I sent them to bed, my firm friends. But the next day, <coughs> we were having breakfast in the great breakfast room. Now that room is an old room, one of the oldest in the house, I'm sure. And at some point, one of the owners of the house has said, Ivy, grow. So the window is dark with it. You can't see any light. And we were in the middle of breakfast when I looked up, and I'm sure I saw him. I'm sure I saw the man who had been looking from the tower, but now I knew him. I knew him from his photo. It was Mr. Quince. And I shivered. For I remember the housekeeper said that he had died the winter before, slipped on ice and that their previous tutor had killed herself, for she had been his mother, there in the school. And I thought of it in front of the bride's children, but I knew I couldn't say anything to alarm them. So rather, I went, I must go, quietly out, and I went into the ivy. But you know, it was all very thick, and there was no sign that anyone had been inside. But I, crept through, and I looked through the window, just to check, and just at that moment, Mrs. Crow came in, and when she saw me, she dropped the tray, and I could hear her scream. So I ran in and I asked, what's happening? What is wrong? And she said, I thought I saw, I thought I saw Miss Francis in the window. And it was all I could do to keep but I must for the children. So I turned to them and said, it is time we all go to the school. I am going to teach you history today. And then, this afternoon, what do you say for picnic on the floor? And Flora said she would love to, but Miles. I'm afraid I have other business to attend to this afternoon, so I shall give you a picnic and miss it. I must not. Boy like him. Never mind. I had taught them history and I was pleased to see how much they learned. And then I and Flora packed up our egg crisp sandwiches and our crisps and our bottles and we'd go and sit on the lawn. And soon we are laughing and playing together. Every inch the girl. And I am not quite sure. 
which of us is enjoying it more. But as we play, I suddenly notice that she's looking over my shoulder. Off. And I steal a glance myself. And I see her. I swear, I see her. Hey, I know that face. I saw it in the pictures. It's Miss Frances with gold ribbed spectacles, wearing the black dress of the governess wears. And I positioned Flora so that she could not see the creature who was watching on the other side of the lake. And I say, Florence, yeah? can you tell me, was Miss Frances a good friend? <laughs> Could a child as pure-hearted as you love anyone bad? And so I took her hand, and I took her inside, because something had struck me. I don't know where mine was this. So I, I, I gave her, I give her, to the housemaid's care, and I go out, having asked first where Miles is likely to be. And Mrs. Crow tells me he'll be in the little house the other side of the lawn. That's where he goes. And I went, and sure enough, there was a house on the other side of the lawn, the kind of house a gamekeeper uses. And it was unlocked. And as I went in, there was a yell of triumph. Yes! And my blood froze! For there was Miles, and he just skinned a rabbit. Child! Child! How could you do such a thing? Where is the purity of your heart? Who told you how to do it? Mr. Quince. Why did he tell you? Well, one a gentleman cannot start learning about hunting too early. Well, you can. I will tell you what, young sir. You are going to come with me. Give me the key. And I locked the door, and I put the key on myself, and I said, tomorrow I'll get another lock. And you will not come here again. Do you understand? And he was certain, but I did not want to keep him angry long. So I talked to him. I opened him out a bit. I invited Flora in. I gave them their favorite food, sausages. I read them stories until it was their bedtime. And they went upstairs, the firm, firm friends. And I sat and I read and I thought, well, the house grew dark, and my mind is full of unquietness. But when it is nearly twelve, I tiptoe upstairs, not wanting to wake Flora. But then I feel them. I feel their gaze in the dark. And I turn my head, and there they both are. Miss Frances and Mr. Quince, watching with angry looks, watching, and I feel, I feel the beat, the beat of their looks, and I light up my lantern bright, and I advance on them, and they seem to retreat, and I smile, but then I notice they are smiling too, and suddenly I feel an icy draft behind me, and I realise so I run up into the bedroom I share with Flora over her. And there she is, standing by the window, looking. And she gave me some childish reason. How could you do such a thing? I'm looking at the moonlight. A child like you knows nothing of the moonlight. And I marched her off the bed. And I locked the window. And I locked the door. For when I had looked out that window, I had seen something. So I ran out. Miles! Miles! What are you doing? Well, I was expelled supposedly for being bad, and today you have called me bad, so I <clears> don't know <throat> be bad. You come with me, young gentleman. And I marched him to his bedroom. I locked the door. And I didn't get him up till ten. And then I invited him down to breakfast. But before I could reprove him, he said something. 
I want to go back to school. But you can't! I must and shall. But he is adamant. So much so that I agree that we will write to your uncle and see what he says. Now, it is Sunday. So I have arranged for the two children to go to church, but I decide not to go. I break off just before the service. I come home. And as I come home, I am sure in my heart of hearts that I must leave them. I must go. I am doing them no favours, I feel. And yet it is heavy. Heavy in my heart when I realise it. And as I come into the house, there is a sound Like it was my own heart breaking. But it comes from the schoolroom. And I open the door, and there in the schoolroom is a woman dressed as a governess, crying 